Now we get to the good stuff. Take your textbook and take a good look at it. Look at the front cover, look at the back cover, look over the introduction, read the conclusion, and be sure to scan through the index if your book has one. And read the colophon page. That's the place where they include information about the book's publication, like the place of publication, the publisher, and the publication date. If you didn't know what a colophon page is, look it up, it's fascinating. I also find the table of contents of a book to be very interesting. These parts of the book are what Gérard Genet called the paratext. This means the text beside the text. This step takes about five minutes and effectively trains your brain to understand the scope and the dimension of the book with respect to the topic. Not included in that five minute estimate is the time it takes to read the conclusion, which could be a much longer process, but you might be wondering, why should you take the extra time to read the conclusion first? Well, partially, it's so you can judge whether or not the author's conclusion about their subject was profound enough to warrant reading the book in the first place. Sometimes when you read a conclusion, you'll realize that the author hasn't arrived at any conclusion that makes it worth reading the process or the argument that substantiates what the author concluded. Okay, so maybe that's a little judgmental. It's certainly not a foolproof way to decide what to read, but when you have 500 books on your plate, it's worth taking the time to determine whether or not the book warrants all that reading. You only have so many hours before your exam, after all, and sometimes you can glean the governing point and a few supporting details without drowning yourself in all the minutia. That said, you must never make the mistake of saying you read a book thoroughly when you haven't. And I'm not suggesting you skim as a matter of habit. Far from it. It's just worth pointing out that some books aren't worth reading and it's fair for you to say something like, when I looked through this book, I found that the author's main points about X, Y, and Z didn't culminate in a particularly profound conclusion. So long as you can then expound upon the next topic in detail, there's nothing wrong with this kind of radical honesty. But you're going to sound very bad and have no way to pivot if someone calls you out and says that you're a lazy reader who missed a ton of critical information. Instead, you want to be able to say something like, thank you for pointing that out. Like I said, when I looked through the book, I didn't find the kinds of evidence you're talking about. Now I can't wait to confirm your findings and we'll look at it again. That's called intellectual honesty. And if this is the only tip you take away from this video, it will probably be worth more to your mental peace in life than anything you can memorize. All that aside, the conclusion and introduction will also give you clues as to where to find the information in the book, or at least the important information. And this location data is often included in the context of the concluding remarks, which can be quite helpful. For example, the author might say, in chapter one, I covered A, B, and C. In chapter two, I talked about this. And in chapter three, I covered that. Introductions also tend to operate like this, and they serve as signposts that are very valuable. They prime your mind and help make it more attentive as you read. Depending on the book, it's also worth taking what Barbara Oakley calls a picture walk in learning how to learn, which I reviewed thoroughly and definitely belongs on your shelf. Get it, ASAP.